Cause you're listening to Jams and Tea You won't see the show on your TV So we talk about things musically Cause you're listening to Jams and Tea you're listening to Jams and Tea Welcome everybody to a new Record Club episode of the Jams and Tea podcast Where we spin the jams and spill the tea And today we have just released our episode Where we review not one, not two, but three new records, one of which from our very own Sersha. We reviewed her debut album, Panic Attacks in Public. We also reviewed the new album by Black Country New Road and the new album from the Foo Fighters. Go check that out if you haven't already seen it. And if you have seen it, welcome. We are going to be talking about Tyler's recommended album today, which is of course, The Cardiacs Sing to God. So um, I will reserve most of my thoughts for last just because i have a habit lately of saying lots of shit and then people are like <laughs> i was gonna say that shit fuck you and so <laughs> i will phrased exactly like that i will but i will give some context um i mean i guess if you're probably watching this you probably already know who the cardiacs were um an english rock band um psychedelic rock pop progressive rock slash metal um they really kind of tried it all um their compositions are complex they're intense um and they're eccentric and they're all over the shop um and they were um fronted by the inimitable tim smith who is an absolute force to be reckoned with um unfortunately um tim smith actually passed away last year after a long battle uh, with illness. Um, so this in many ways uh, is a tribute to him, at least on my part anyway, um, because while I don't know exactly how the others here feel about this record, and I could, I could see it being divisive, to be honest. It is a very confrontational listen. And um, Tim as a personality is, I think, magnetic and absolutely gripping, but I could see being wearisome and I kind of think that Tim would accept that as well because it's kind of part of the whole shtick. Uh, it is a um, psychological miasma of uh, imagery and thoughts that loosely connect to observations about um, British society, um, society in general, worship, um, the darker parts of humanity, all these kinds of different ideas are kind of locked into this one record in particular, Sing to God, which was kind of the apotheosis of Cardiacs as a project. They did release a number of albums before it, um, particularly I want to shout out to uh, absolutely great records in, on their own right, A Little Man in a House in the Whole World Window and On Land and in the Sea, which showcase this kind of style of really banging heavy, um, but hooky arrangements um in a concise package that is um beguiling and frustrating a little bit but also just purely viscerally enjoyable i think i was immediately drawn to cardiacs the moment i discovered them and i kind of built up to this album in particular a while as did they i believe um this album took a long time to record and some of the tracks on here are actually, were actually originally recorded over a decade before this album even came out. Um, you get songs on this record like Nurses Whispering Verses, which actually features on their first two demo records in different forms from the 80s, but was reworked and polished and, ex and exists here in its kind of definitive, all-encompassing form. But, um, but yeah, of course, Tim Smith... uh, a, a Mr. Bungle comparison in that sense c could be uh, in line. Yeah, absolutely. Like in the way that Mr. Bungle workshopped um, a lot of the songs that featured on their debut record and various forms. Um, so too has Sing to God kind of uh, evolved from the Cardiac's career leading up to it incredibly diverse and interesting band um with a, a, a if you look at all the members that have ever been in cardiacs you've got a list of about 20 people um all of whom are playing um various eccentric and eclectic roles um only some of whom 
which feature on Sing to God, but um, all of the people that do feature on Sing to God leave a very um, marked impression and contribute to a swirling, chaotic mess of sounds that nevertheless is absolutely tethered together by these really great arrangements, songwriting, and an absolute instinctive knowledge of hooks. And that is due to two particular people. So obviously Tim Smith is the chief songwriter here and wrote, I think, 90% of this record. And Tim is a, uh, a man who understands how to take the absolute chaos of his mind and transpose it into music that is addictive and catchy and filled with hooks and blares out at you, but also kind of sucks you into it. And the other um, most important player on this record, not to obviously devalue the others, is John Poole, who is responsible for a lot of the sound of this record itself and wrote some songs as well. But the um, buzzing guitar freak out nature of it and the keyboards on this record um, are all um, results of, of Poole's influence on the creative direction of the band as well. And so... While it's very much Tim's thing, uh, Tim is guided and lifted up by um, the other people in the band as well. But yeah, as I say, it's a Sing to God is an, as a 90 minute record. There's a lot happening on this album. It kind of takes it out of you, I think. Um, but I, for one, think it's never less than fascinating, even if it's kind of also baffling. And so um, before I really get into what I love about this record and what I think the record is about, because I think it's more than just uh, banging, clanging sounds that I think sound good. I think there is real substance to these songs, but I would like to sort of hear what you guys think of it first. Um, if anyone wants to sort of jump in with your thoughts. Jake. I would like to go first because this is going to be the most tangential segment on this particular episode, I think. Um, this segment is not a segment. It is an apology uh, to Tyler from me. Um, I would like to preface this with the fact that I like this album and that I think it is very good. I am also a fucking idiot. <laughs> This album, I, I even before you suggested it, I was like, I, I had been trying to listen to it just because I, I don't remember who first talked about it, but someone, I, I okay, it had been mentioned on a Q and A with uh, Anthony Fantano once, and I was just like, okay, this looks interesting. I've never heard of this band before. They have highly rated albums, so I, I like listened to like the first three songs on this, and I was like, okay. <laughs> I'm not in the headspace to listen to this right now, but you know, I'll put it off. And then the work one day, I was just like, okay, let's try this again. I got four songs in and was just like, mm, maybe not right now. And then Tyler put it on the docket for uh, us, to, us to listen to. And I was like, okay, now I have to, now I have to sit, finally sit down and listen to it. And I listened to um, another Cardiacs release, uh, Little Man in the in the House, The Whole World Window, whatever the fuck that album is fucking called. It's good. And and then I was just like, all right, I have a frame of reference. Uh, I'm gonna, we're gonna sit down, we're gonna talk about this. And then it's just like, as soon as I hit play, my brain becomes static. Like there's, it's it's every single song on here front to back this is an album that's also divided into two albums a lot of the time on streaming even though it's one album um but it's like there's like a front half and a back half uh but i i consume it as as, as one thing and i tried doing it as like one and then kind of like stopping and then another one like like every single song on this album is good M most of them are great the problem is that there's like 22 of them and when you condense that into one listening experience, it fucking fries your brain. <laughs> like, I can't explain how this is so taxing on me to listen to when I'm able to take the repetition of Swans the Seer in stride, or when I regularly listen to things like Devin Townsend, who in his most experimental ventures, I think is highly comparable to this, or as August mentioned, Mr. Bungle is also something there too. It's just that 
I feel like one of the the, the guiding tenets of, of this musical project is to basically just take everything and turn it to 11. And I'm not trying to minimize it or trying to, uh, to, to downplay its accomplishments by saying that, but I do think that is a very intentional, you know, pushing of the envelope musically in order to, to do that. And like Tyler even mentioned, you know, that it being a lot for some people would, would probably be something that Tim would expect. I just did not anticipate this particularly for, for me to fall into that side of the circle of the Venn diagram. It's, it's, it's something where I can acknowledge uh, first and foremost how uniformly excellent the playing is. Like, this is, like, I, like, I don't know who is in this band beyond M Mr. Tim Smith, but like... It's, it's a lot of relatives of Tim Smith and other people. Yeah, like, these musicians are like operating at a, a shockingly good level and the production only enhances that, I think, like, on a sometimes line by line basis, the amount of different shit that everyone has to do and the, the, the speed with which you have to transition into the different segments of these, these songs structurally is nothing short of a, a like mind boggling achievement. It, it reminds me a lot of Dream Theater's album, Train of Thought, where it's, it's pretty much just like Dream Theater, but 11. And that's, basically my problem is that I don't like that album. I, I like this album a lot more than that one actually. But at the same time, it is something where like everything in it is good. It's just by virtue of the fact that there's so fucking much of it that I can't process it all. Like if you just ask me, it's just like, yeah, great, 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 great. But when you congeal it all into one thing, it just, it, it really becomes difficult to actually process. And the only way I could actually like try and and be able to to talk about these songs at all was if I listened to one waited and then listened to another and then waited and then listened to another and then waited and this album is already an hour and a half long and it just becomes a fucking ordeal and I hate that and I hate that for me and I hate that for Tyler and I hate that for this album just because it deserves a more devoted attention span than mine apparently but like I just feel like by design, this is just going to break some people because it's just, it's a lot. That said, I wanna point out some highlights that I think are just genuinely very, very good. It also definitely um, doesn't help that I think a lot of the lyrical and thematic content is A, deliberately quite obtuse, B, very strangely delivered because Tim has a very unique vocal presence, which takes time to acclimate to, and it's constantly processed in weird and interesting ways. And it's just, some of the music here is just absolutely fucking arrhythmic and strange. I mean, like there's points where like at the very, is it in specific, is it, is it in Eden on the Air that um, they have, they keep singing about things being odd and then the Eden, or is that the next song? I can't remember. It all just kind of... It's a song fun. that's called something like that. Give me a sec. Well, it's th there's like these moments where it's just like the song is just sort of going along and then suddenly it'll have to be like... And, and you're just kind of like, whoa! And you mean the like, song Odd Even, perchance? Uh, no, actually, I don't believe I know so. Because that's, that's... I, know, I know exactly what you mean, and I just can't think of which yeah. song it is now. It, it, it's, it's one of the first I ones think on it is. Here. I think it is the first song, actually. I think you're yeah. right. And, and actually, that little lyrical moment kind of unlocks, I think, a lot of what's to be understood about the album, in a sense, is that it's sort of singing about conformity and how, you know, like, singing about this, this perspective of, like, liking things a specific way, and then, like, oh, you know, you can do this, but we like it this way, and then immediately the next song just, like, fucking tunnels you, fucking eat it up, Worms Hero, which is, like, this... I, I, I can't... I, I like... I trying to convey what this album actually sounds like without like just spilling out word salad is like trying to, it, it's like Lovecraft trying to describe a, a particular horror that's just so specifically unimaginable and indescribable that it like, not only do words not exist in the English language that could use me, like that I could use, but like I lack the organ in my body to be able to make the sounds to speak those words. 
And then there's still moments on here that I feel can be enjoyed as just really interesting progressive music. Um, uh, my, my favorite song with, with one exception that I will get to uh, being Fiery Gun Hand, which yes. just, I mean, Fiery Gun Hand just goes fucking hard. It's a hard ass song. And uh, that, that's a lot of the appeal with like my favorite moments on the record is that it's just like, it, it, it just shoots for the moon and like breaks the moon. And, <laughs> it, and it's just, you're suddenly like, it, it, there's like this incredible amount of, of switching of time signatures and, and polyrhythms and fucking just insane shit. And then there's also just moments of fucking insane weirdness, like insect hoofs on Lassie, which just, there's a, there's a lot of really strange lyrical moments on this record that like even I, uh, one of the biggest Mars Volta fans on earth and you know, you know, I'm like in a podcast with the first, um, <laughs> I, you know, I, I'm, I'm pretty used to lyrics being like, whoa, hey oh but like this is, the, 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 a lot of this stuff is just like, I feel might be written off as like a kind of, oh, law random kind of thing. And I'm not even going to necessarily say that that's like wrong some of the time, because I think a, I think a good bit of it could probably be like the intention of just sort of being like, uh, like a Pollock painting, but lyrically. But it's also definitely gesturing at lots of different ideas, again, especially about, I think, like conformity. Um, a lot of it, too, is um, just the, the idea of... Uh, following like straying from the pack I guess it would be of, of just like being different and being weird and like trying to break from the, the 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 confines of normal society and it's like filtered through this weird primal animal lens of just like almost like it, it, it's like listening to what an an animal would speak like if they could suddenly speak English and, and as a result you're just kind of sitting there like okay I need to like take a minute and, and read this um but it's also just home to to many moments I will say um two specific songs I think that come on the, the later half of the track list that hit hard are um, Red Fire coming out from his gills, which if the song titles I've been talking about so far have not indicated to you what kind of album this is, I don't know what to tell you. Um, but uh, what, What's funny is that maybe more than you realize, the song titles Insect Hoofs on Lassie and Red Fire coming out from his gills actually tell you basically a lot about what the song is actually about. <laughs> Yes, I, I think that like if you use all of the information given to you, you can definitely come to a more definitive conclusion here. And like I don't think there is a better lyrical ethos than the song I just mentioned, which is Red Fire coming out from his gills, where it, they just start saying, one million miles an hour, faster than a torpedo, morbid seas, the morbid breeds, unity seas, or untidy seas. Um, meanwhile, on the wrong side of fences, all killing and dashing of brains next to normal with li normal life with games and companions shouting too loud for him to sing, which I feel like that lyrical passage is basically the entire album if it was condensed down to a paragraph. Yeah. So um, I just want to riff for a second, um, mm. just because I had a thought um, that kind of touches into what I feel about the album, but I couldn't quite articulate until just now, thanks to you. Um, so I want to make clear that and though the album, though the lyrics on this record seem surrealistic, I mean, they are surrealistic, but they might seem kind of like too imagistic and too obtuse. I think there is genuine meaning behind all of them. And I think the insect hoofs and, on Lassie and um, Red Fire coming out as gills, are, it's, it's just funny that you brought those two songs up in close proximity because I think they're kind of about the same thing. Um, and it's this idea of perverting nature. So uh, yeah. Insect Hoofs on Lassie is this as a song in which um, Tim is basically recounting a childhood love of Lassie, the dog in the movie and the show or whatever. And it's like you get this um, nostalgic image of that, but it's contorted and it's disturbed and it's rippled through the a kind of perversion of him having grown up and having you know having lived and and it being in a state of complete uh disarray about the world that 
the sense of confusion and, and media saturation and kind of just the general uh, absurdity of the world is kind of filtered back into this nostalgic recollection such that it's now kind of perverted something that was once kind of a symbol of 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 pure childhood joy uh, enjoying watching an episode of Lassie is now this kind of like fucked thing that um and, and I will be the first to admit that Tim kind of goes about expressing this in a very kind of strange and sort of esoteric way but I think it kind of gets at the nature of um the way that Tim kind of sees the beautiful natural aspects of the world as having become perverted and fucked by human intervention. And he often links this notion of, um, or, or these ideas of animals as these pure things um, to his interest in religion and divinity and the idea of worship specifically. And that makes me think of a song like Dog Like Sparky, for instance, which is we basically a about dog like Sparky. Incredibly that's, catchy. That's, fun. that's catchy as fuck. And it's basically a song about kind of worshiping this animal deity. And it's presented to you in this way that's like, it's almost like um, an infomercial like the way in which the information is conveyed to you like do you want to believe or have you ever believed in big strong data and, leaks and 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 then there's the fucking choir of like child vocals that are just like we want the thing that you're talking yeah. about it's like <laughs> propagandistic right and and yeah. it's painting this kind of like warped and distorted view and so tim's kind of really interested in in ideas of worship and he kind of ties i think or sees the perversion of humanity or the um you know the fuckedness of human uh, he sees religion as kind of being emblematic of that and so he's tying mm. this notion of like human perversion into worship and so it's like um you have this beautiful natural thing which is animals and you have um people perverting nature through their um you know whatever means and whatever activities and then kind of worshiping this perverted thing that they have created it's kind of every this kind of miasma of shit that people have created on the planet suddenly becomes this thing that then is emblematic to them of their greatness and becomes an idol um, and that may be kind of a society whatever idea that feels a little heavy-handed but I think the genius of Tim is the way that he goes about expressing this through the most um, strange of ways it's kind of like the way that David Lynch comments on celebrity culture for instance like it's or or like just on um, media stuff like he it's it's a topic that would be very easy to just do in a really tired and basic way but kind of gets into the a fabric that is underneath it and just sort of like really kind of brings the ugliness up and frames the ugliness in a way that's kind of slanted if that makes any sense i think i'm no, just literally I, just saying I, words at this point no, but. no 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 i think that makes perfect sense and i would also like to extend the idea that maybe perhaps in in a sort of parallel way that the reason this album is the way it is and even the cardiac music being the way that it is as a whole the the sort of the, the mentality of perverting it i feel like maybe he could win in, in and of himself view himself as being able to pervert the traditional idea of music and that's sort of how it reflects the theme. And I don't know if that's maybe me looking too far into it, but I, I think that it's, I, I'm glad you went on that tangent because it presents an, something very important here and that I feel like you could basically, anybody who takes the time to, could basically write a novella about each one of these songs. I feel like you could analyze them and break them down into tiny little things. And the reason that I'm speaking about this holistically is to prevent myself from doing just that. And it also doesn't really get at wh how I how I feel about all of it, um, because it, it's being done in a way that just I haven't heard be done before. The the way that all of this is happening is simply something I have not experienced in the medium of music, and as such, I can completely understand the appeal of all of it. I would also like to just shout out one uh, final specific song as being great, and I'm pretty sure this. Uh, 
track specifically is going to get no uh, shortage of praise from this podcast specifically, at least if I had to bet that this would be the song that would be like the crown jewel considered. But um, I mean, Nurse's Whispering Verse is holy fucking shit. Uh, it, it's 10 minutes of like, it's 10 minutes of getting your shit rocked. That's, that's, it, it is, it is the heavy, basically it reminds me of um, the most recent Devin Townsend project, Empath, where Devin is just like, I am going to be just the most crushingly self-indulgent, uh, make th- that music and make it hard as fuck. And Nurses Whispering Verses, as such, is the most Cardiacs song that the Cardiacs have, have made here. It's, it, is a, it is a divine revelation in terms of music. It's like, it's, it's like looking at something that should only be manifested in the, in the fucking book of revelations in the Bible. It's fucking insane. And lyrically, it's even like, it's pretty minimal considering the length. Like, it just doesn't... It, it, but but it does get at very like specific ideas and I just I I feel more than anything disappointed in myself just because I feel like this album deserves better than me because there's so much happening here and it's so interesting and it's so clearly thoughtful and it's so fucking evident that everybody here is just at the top of their fucking game just going unbelievably hard and it is just designed in a way that is like I have found my limit I have pushed myself to the final musical of stream of being like this is where I draw the line of being able to enjoy this specific flavor of what this is like I was getting close with Mr. Bungle I I, I orbited that with Devin Townsend I, I flirt with it on stuff like the Bedlam and Goliath but this is this is the zenith of progressive music. In fact, it is so progressive, it is alienating, which in a way I think is the most complimentary thing I can possibly fucking say about it, is that it is so progressive, it has progressed past my mind and comprehension. Like it sounds like, I I feel almost lazy in this, but it's just fucking impossible not to talk about this album unless I have written a literal fucking book about it. Yeah, and I look, I cannot, in many ways, it's unfair. Like, I, you've only had this album in your life for a very short amount of time. Uh, I've, and, and you just kind of, it's very difficult. I, I don't think I could have reviewed this a few days after I first listened to it anyway. So I've, I've, I've benefited from the fact that I've heard this album probably 20 times. Um, and I fucking adore it. Um, but yeah, it's, a, it's, it's, and I just like the first fucking, yeah, the first fucking like five listens at least is just kind of like acclimatizing. And it's not been until recently that I've been really able to kind of try and think about what this album is actually about um, and what the purpose is to the madness. Um, but, yeah, there is a method to it all. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, and I think what keeps it grounded and why I, and I, I don't know if anyone will agree with me and I don't really care to be honest, but why I kind of prefer this to Mr. Bungle uh, is that there is an inherent knowledge of um, hooks and, and just a, a sense of structure that I think Bungle deliberately issues. That's part of its appeal and part of the intent of that project. Um, but this is like trying to condense the kind of fiery insanity that has the same sort of energy as what they come conjure on the Mr. Bungle album, but package it to you in these um, shorter bursts with a, the occasional kind of longer, like they, there are longer pieces on this record, but what's important to note about them is that they aren't shifting like you might expect a longer piece of music to do. It's just that you're getting... Um, it is more, it needs to be that long for it the proper effect of the piece to be felt whereas other songs can do that in a short amount of time um and i think it's interesting as well that you bring up that devin townsend record empath i haven't heard that but i believe that's the record where he has like a disney song on it isn't it yeah i mean that's the song where he like he his entire the entire first song is him destroying the world so that he can create a new one and him basically singing about how ridiculously indulgent his entire career has been it is the most wild shit i've ever heard and it doesn't fucking hold a 
candle to anything on this album. Yeah, well, the reason I bring it up is like, I haven't heard that album, but I have heard, I think, a uh, live performance of one of the Disney tracks. And what it made me think of um, was actually a different song on this record called Wireless, where you have this really insistent and aggressive yeah. riff that's kind of barreling through the track. And then the track at the end of the track, you have this beautiful string section that's kind of feels like a movie score and it's kind of the last one on the first half yeah yeah and i think like obviously i think that it's kind of hilarious when that string section comes in considering what precedes it it's kind of like a joke um um, but dream theater on train of thought does the same thing there's a fucking xylophone in the middle of one of the songs and it's just like (laughs) fucking what but yeah it's beautiful and also on that song just incidentally you get um tim smith reading a children's story about (laughs) a magical fish i think and then that story he kind of goes inside of that story and talks about it in red fire coming out from his gills um um, and that's just another example of like um, these images of, of animals being imbued with these co- either powers that they shouldn't have um, or just being kind of mutated or fucked in some way. Um, yeah, uh, I guess that's enough without going deep too deep. Um, yeah. God, this is good. Like I hearing you, you speak about this and I'm sure it'll continue to happen is just giving me more thoughts that i've never had until good um, i'm glad i was able to provide something because i have like every single time i've listened to this i was just waiting i was just like please oh god please click with my brain something fucking happened yeah but you've you have absorbed the record though you have i think understood the effect and probably the intent of it and, and oh yeah I, I get the appeal in fucking spades like i listen to this and i'm just like a fucking course tyler loved this album this is the most fucking th-. like i get it 100 percent. i'm just sitting there like man i fucking i fucking got it man. yeah well i mean not that i expect you to necessarily want to spend more time with it but i hope that with time it starts to make a little bit that, more sense that, that's the thing is that i i i want to like revisit this in like six months and come back to it and just be like i wonder what this will sound like to me now because genuinely it's one of the most like you you hear it and it feels like the it feels like music that doesn't exist in like a a a static state it feels like music that you're just like sticking your head in a waterfall and the water is the music and it's just fucking barreling down at top fucking speed and pouring over you and it's never the same droplets it's just fucking going I will say there is, you know, me being an album purist, despite that, I do find myself sometimes just putting random songs on this on. Like um, my, probably my most listened song on here is Fiery Gun Hand, which I Fiery Gun Hand and Dog Like Sparky fucking whip. Which I just put on sometimes because I want to get that because that song just immediately kicks your door down and, and skull fucks you immediately. And sometimes <laughs> you just want to get that effect straight away. Sometimes you just want to be skull fucked by a song. Um, uh, yeah. And so that's, yeah. I, so I would not necessarily object to um, just picking out and listening to individual songs on this record. I think that uh, a lot of its best moments work like that as much as the whole has that effect too. Yeah. But yeah. Okay, um, who would like to share their thoughts next on Sing to God? Or just riff on it, who gives a fuck? Well, August, what's the most you've ever lost on a coin toss? No. Um... (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I mean, uh, I can go if if you'd be fine with that. Um, Yeah, go on. Okay. So, Sing to God. This is a record I think is quite interesting in what it's doing. On one hand, we're getting a lot of uh, is social commentary, as, as I read it, about the kind of desensitization of society, is how I read this album. Yeah, that's definitely a theme there also as uh, well. And, and I'll kind of get into... Sp- a specific example of that in a second and also the uh and also as tyler has already readily pointed out the uh deifying of nature at its base and then the perversion of that particularly in uh with dogs being the kind of 
main uh, focus of that. And I, I think just that as a concept where it's kind of going for these two separate things is very interesting, very ambitious, uh, obviously. And uh, Eden on Air is kind of our intro track into this uh, this world. It feels very kind of fairy tale esque in the way it's it's presented with this very with the it's very low key. It's got a lot of these uh, wind chimes across it, and uh, it establishes this really nice intro that is meant to establish the rug under you as then eat it up worm hero proceeds to burn that rug from under yeah. you <laughs> yeah it's like the opening track is like you know the garden of eden literally like the nature at its purest yeah. and then eat it up worms hero is the perversion crashing on top of it and also there should be something to be said about that uh worms being decomposers so i think uh i think that could be intentional maybe me reading into that a bit but uh no, no i mean that's yeah. totally fair uh i think it's a and that's where it gets into the kind the this record's true just manic colors show themselves uh compositionally i think these i i find it interesting that the tracks can have so much packed into them to the point where i i almost find myself i think it would take any living person far more time than it is reasonable to write down every single detail and pop whir that happens in every single one of these tracks because uh, Mr. Tim Smith is certainly a very interesting composer combining a, kind of with a very throw everything at the wall kind of style except a, a much more refined version of that I found. He, a lot of the time, I think what he's doing sticks. I'll get into more of what I don't think quite sticks in a minute, but uh, Dog like Sparky. I, I really love the manic shifts in time signatures between the verses and the choruses here. Uh, there's, there's another song that does this. I couldn't think of it uh, when writing and I can't think of it now, but the way it's almost makes me nauseous just the way how the song can be blaring at a crazy speed and then pull you back in and go like whoa and it's it's a consistent effect i thought that was very very good i i thought the uh yeah of course there's the glorification of nature and, and this record i think does have a good sense of humor about itself there's there's some fun to be had with what's being said some funny turns of phrases and uh, and the sense of the sense of humor definitely complements the chaotic instrumentals. So it's not like uh, it, if this record was just dead serious, I think it would be completely terrible and not work at all. Uh, because obviously you need a, a degree of, of comedy when when tackling this. I, I think that the, that irreverence is just baked into every aspect of the record, such that yeah, I can definitely. imagine what it would sound like if it were serious. If it were, yes, yeah, serious, I, I don't think it would work at mm. all. No, I agree. Uh, and yeah, Fiery Gun Hand, I think, is, is a great example of when the record takes darker subject matter, but it never gets bogged down in that. This being a song, as I read it, about a, a guy who kills himself, and then the disillusionment of the person who just has to clean up his dead body. I thought that was a very uh, kind of funny point yeah. about society being made. As, as Jake has, of course, alluded to with the, the social commentary aspects of this record. Uh, I will say, though, past a certain point, I do feel a lot of this album can blur together. I think the stretch between uh, Dirty Boy and Nurse's Whispering Verses, it becomes a bit of a complete blur with the a couple tracks that are only like a minute or two minutes long that I feel end up not sticking with me enough to really get into those songs and get a sense of what they're what they're going for. L and stinks, for example. I I I yeah I will jump to the defense of the shorter songs and say that while 
they took more listens to distinguish themselves from me, especially coming later in the record um, when you've already been kind of overwhelmed. Uh, that's why I kind of, I don't mind the idea of it being split in two, but I think that part two starting with Dirty Boy is a mistake um, because to me, it's up right after Dirty Boy where there's a noticeable shift in the record. And I think the record needs that because it's deliberately structured to have this these two assaultive centerpieces, Wireless yeah, and Dirty no. Boy. And, and what and, I... Uh, sorry. And if I may, what I tried to... I Because I heard this about four times in preparation and I listened to this uh, uh, one, two times split in half, two times all together, and I found that even when I split this record in half and gave myself like an hour in between the two halves, I did still find it just a bit hard to get into that second half. Maybe that's just a me problem. Maybe it's a record prob problem I have with this record. Uh, I don't know. And I, I will say, I also did feel the constant use of group vocals got really tiresome after a certain point. It got to the point where I was just by the end of it outright sick of it and i was not having it at all it just was a complete turnoff for me and i found that that could also be with once this record like pulls a couple of the same tricks again and again i found myself i found them to be very irritating annoying even and, and I get that that can be part of the appeal, the just absolute manicness of it. But sometimes I just uh, I just thought it didn't quite work. Uh, but I will say, the longest songs on here, like Wireless, Dirty Boy, and Nurses Whispering Verses are particularly great. Uh, uh, Dirty Boy, in particular, I think had a very memorable, great intro riff to it. And I did really love the sense of grandiosity on this track and how uh, only once and how for the most part it only had one singer at the point and in opposition to a lot of the record and I, I thought that worked exceptionally well for this track it gave it a good uh, good balance it stood out well in the track list and it was I think as Tyler has made the point of it, this really good centerpiece to divide the record although I, I can see why you would why you do uh, think it is a bit of a mistake to place it where it is, but well, it's, it's I not a mistake. I don't think it's a mistake to place it where it is. I just think it's a mistake oh, okay. to divide yeah. the record such that the second half begins with it. Yeah. Okay. I see. Uh, and I get and a bit of that I think comes from you know album building and that both of the CDs need to be about the same runtime and it doesn't. Quite and I just work. like, I, yeah, I just think, I mean, I know there's obvious, there might be disagreement, but I just think that the whole thing flows so well. I mean, regardless of what you think about maybe individual songs, I think there's a real sense of forward movement th from song to song. I think that's especially acute on the second half, actually, such that, yes, perhaps the individual different songs blur together a bit, but I kind of see it as like a suite, like particularly um, uh, Billion through Flap Off You Beak. Uh, I see is kind of just a suite of music that kind of it's kind of like a Beach Boys Beatles kind of thing structurally anyway um, and I just think the hooks are really there especially on Flap Off You Beak which is one of my favorite songs in the album. Yeah, no, I mean I, I can definitely buy into that to a certain extent how that uh, that would work for people as like a big continuous piece and there's definitely I think with the uh, bell stinks and bell clinks there's definitely some obvious instrumental intention that that is meant to be the way it's experienced with how that those two tracks just connect pretty seamlessly and lead right into each other uh and you know i also uh i i like the way that the album can uh can put some sounds into both of your ears. I think there's a, a nice effort made to balance, to have some sounds in one ear, some sounds in another, which is not something I, I tend to notice being a bit hard of hearing in one ear. But here I, I did have, uh, I did uh, catch it a couple times and I thought it was neat. Uh, and I will say there is certainly, 
something positive to be said about the very maximal approach to so much of this and how, how the overwhelming nature of it is certainly admirable. I just, uh, I, I just think when it comes to a record's construction, you sometimes need moments to just balance out that extremeness and when this, and I find this record, and yes, by design lacks those moments, but it did for me feel as a detriment to my experience of it that it just never gives me a second to breathe. And I, sometimes I just felt I could have really used that. And, uh, you know, so that's that. I think it's a, it's a very interesting record. I want to give it another listen or two, but uh, for now, I think it's uh it's a good, good experiment that I don't fully connect with, even if I do really enjoy some of the, the commentary on religion and society being made. I think a very fair and balanced take. I think yeah, yeah the, the, fair the, and balanced. The, the maximalism of this thing is obviously by design, and they are certainly making a, a uh, conscious decision in doing so that yeah. you know we're not making something that will necessarily be for everyone maybe not even for all of our fans um but this is just a reflection of of um where we're we're at or where tim's at at least um and yeah it's yeah your and mileage I, I may would, vary I, I would like to say i think it's interesting how the uh, reception of this has really shifted over time because yeah it got a zero out of 10 yeah review it got a zero it zero only review that's just fucking ridiculous and and then uh, of course time passes and it gets uh pretty universally showered with praise as a uh, as a cult classic and i think that's a really uh even though the term cult classic can just be kind of thrown at anything i think it has a very good use here in that this record is for a very specific type of person. And if you're into that, you're just going to love it. Mm. Another Hence, thing I think. And cult. Yeah, totally. Sorry. Just as an aside worth noting, I just noticed on the Wikipedia page for this, that the band have stated that the album being split into two separate halves was a complete mistake and was not ever. Yeah, intended. that makes sense. Um, so mm. that's, I guess, maybe contextualizes that a little bit. That's, uh, I mean, that's yeah. interesting though because um, I do feel like the two halves of the record have very different characters. Um, yeah, they do. That's true. I feel like that's um, just the inherent progression of a single piece, just yeah, by merit. Like I can completely that, like, understand yeah. if you want to make a single piece of ninety-minute piece, um, it would make sense to have the second half. Um, be less of an affront than the first half, which I feel like this record is. Um, and then when you split the record down the middle, it's completely coincidental. But the change feels so like immediate to me. Uh, I, it, it definitely is between Dirty Boy and Billion. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like Dirty Boy is very clearly uh, the hook on the second half of the record, if you were to split it down the middle. Um, Dirty Boy is also probably my favorite song on the record and has my favorite moment on the record, uh, that being uh, the, the the end, which is uh, transcendently raging and oppressive. Yeah, I think transcendence a word that is very easy to overuse, but my God, if anything deserves mm. it, it is the mm. finale of the song. And yeah, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't tend to use it lightly. Yeah, uh, no. I don't think it will surprise any of you to hear, or maybe it will, but... Um, Dirty Boy is generally agreed by most Cardiax fans to be the band's greatest song. Well, oh, good yeah. choice, really. I mean, um, in a way, it's yeah. a great one. I, I yeah, not that. That. In a way, it feels slightly bad because um, Hawks and Jake have already covered so much of what I wanted to say. Um, and uh, Tyler as well, on what you've said so far, at least. Um, and I suppose um, if I was to just talk on it as much as I can. Uh, whatever else you think whatever else I think about this record um, it is impossible to deny its artistic achievement um, it's impossible to not listen to it and be completely bowled over by 
the sheer ambition that was fulfilled. And you know, you can make an ambitious record. Um, it's very easy to set out to make an ambitious record. It's a completely other thing to fulfill every artistic ambition you have. And very few people do. I don't even think the people who made this record probably did, but um, it's a very hard thing to fulfill most of them. And I feel like uh, this is a very, very, very cohesive artistic achievement that's 90 minutes long. It's, it's a feature length album. Um, and whatever else you think of it, that deserves applause. Um, there are many, many, many points on this record that I think are staggering. Um, be that Dirty Boy or, or Wireless or Bali or Man Who. Um, it's just peppered with moments that will take your breath away. Um, but it's also peppered with like synth keyboard moments that I find mildly grating or incredibly layered vocals that are just sort of, the, the, the mix is so very towards the top that I, I, I struggle. Um, and I, I've listened to this record three, four times now. And I, every time there have been moments where I cannot look away from, from, my, from my Spotify account in a good way just like what the hell is going on i i am in the moment here but there mm. are equally moments where um i, I kind of want to get on to the next moment that's of that level um uh, and i i do i do struggle to tell whether that's um either uh, uh like a like a me thing where I just I built my expectations up so high with how good the album can be, or or if it's if, if if it's an album thing, and I think in the end that's down to taste more than anything. But I remember when we talked about um, "Those Your Dreams" by Fucked Up, which is another uh, feature length rock punk rock opera, um, and I just had so much more of an emotional connection with that record, um, and I I think that was what really kept me going through the most excessive moments of that album. And, and, uh, and as much as I think the lyrics are very well written here, I, I, don't, I don't have that as much. And I feel bad because everything nice I have to say about the record has already been covered. And I feel very, very, very positively about the record. I That's like it very, very much. That's I like so it very much. It's okay to uh, say that um, everything you wanted to say has already been said. They don't feel well, it's not that everything I want to say has been said. Everything positive I want to say ah, has been said. Touche. Um, Amore. <laughs> I'm sorry. I I <laughs> <a> stage <laughs> for depression. Um. Anyway, but no, I like this record very much. Um. I just have some moments where I see. Even then, how can I falter? Because it is like the pinnacle of what it wants to be. So, but there are records very much like it that I just emotionally connect with more, I suppose. Mm -hmm. And there are like, there's like a synth line here or there that is kind of garish and that I don't get on with. And it's just peppered across the record. Yeah, I mean, I think ultimately um, it's the thing with you, Sersha, is that you, the emotional connection is quite key. And it is for, honestly for me as well, like uh, with a lot of records, but to me, um, I don't know, this isn't really a record where the appeal is any, has anything to do with emotional connection to me, or maybe I guess it kind of does, but like this is an album that's to me just pure catharsis. Uh, yeah. And not like catharsis is in the sense that, you know, a particular emotion is being expressed that I, and in a really loud way that I vibe with. It's just like, it's less about emotion and it's just more about like capturing a particular kind of internal psychological chaos um and i don't know like there's just something about this album that touches a nerve in my brain that nothing else i've ever heard does it's like it it it, it latches on to a particular i don't even know if feelings the right word but kind of like state of mind that i sometimes slip into where it's kind of like i'm manic and i don't even know what i'm feeling and i the world is like incredibly overwhelming and i want it to just go away and i'm kind of like it, it latches it just feels like it captures this very specific mindset of mania that i um i mean i'm not like 
you know, I don't not like diagnosed with anything, but I do experience manic episodes infrequently and they are horrifying, um, especially uh, once I'm out of them. And, and this album kind of just feels like um, it, it, it lets you into the mindset of someone who is current, who is constantly experiencing a mania on 100. And, and it kind of tries to understand that feeling as well as just purely subject you to it. And that me saying this, this is not even like a defense of the album. It's just an observation. Like that doesn't make it inherently, it doesn't give it inherently positive or good qualities it just i think describes why it will appeal to some people whereas it may frustrate others and that's not to say that you know it'll it will appear appeal to you if you experience mania and that's not to say that at all but just that for me anyway it feels like it i mean perhaps it's the case that it, it hits too close to home um, and that's why it's difficult to process. Um, but it's, I just find it immensely cathartic. It, it, it feels like um, some, I don't even I know what to say. I, I, I feel, just, I feel I, I'm not trying to speak for you or anything, but I, I, as somebody with a similar problem, I feel like maybe the idea you're trying to get across is that this is a perfect relaying of it, it sort of externalizes the internal for you. It's basically a a replication of a very, very specific state of mind. And I do that a lot with music. And I feel like it's, at least the comfort I find in it is reassuring that like, there is a piece of art that knows how I feel. And that makes like my soul pacified. It's, it's more than that though. It's kind of like this album is my Ritalin. Like I, yeah. <laughs> I can just listen to it. Um, and it will kind of like it, it's chaos it's it, maximalism will is like a it's like taking a bath to me it like just it's not that it calms me necessarily but it's that it kind of helps me feel less confused I guess I don't know even though the album itself is confusing this is really weird emotional tangible shit I'm getting into now but like this the effect this thing has is so strange <laughs> and there's just nothing else like it for me and and i can i love to intellectualize it i love to talk about it on all these different levels of significance and what the album is about i think that uh, there's so much to richly unlock there but i also it also just provides me with this immensely cathartic experience that i think is all the more valuable for the fact that i'm not even exactly sure in what way it's cathartic <laughs> like it just is it's so um, very specific i can't like i completely understand that um and i think particularly the moment where this is most greatly felt is on dirty boy which uh, to me is if not actually the loudest um it's certainly one of the loudest things i've ever heard it is an intense assault on the ears it begins in a place of pure um melodic but still noise and just stays there for 10 minutes straight the other long tracks on this record all kind of meander through quieter sections um that kind of fill out the multi-part thing whereas this is just a full-on attack and i love the there's really strange chord shifts and key changes in this track which means it never quite goes where you expect it to and honestly the first few times i heard this album i was just so bewildered by this song that i wasn't sure where it sat for me or how i really felt because it was just too intense of an experience to fully process and and um and yeah, and then, yeah, yeah. And that, I guess it's kind of the album in a nutshell, right? Like, um, it, it, you know that there is musical brilliance happening here, but it's so strange and unnatural and unpredictable in the way that it goes about expressing its ideas that it's kind of difficult to be anything but in awe of it or frustrated by it or simply just overwhelmed. Um, 
but I'm so glad it exists. I'm so glad this album exists. Um, yeah. Well, is that all we have to say? I mean, yeah, I didn't even really need to review this. I, you kind of, you guys just kind of brought all my feelings out one by one. I feel like this is your, at least this album does to you what Devin Townsend, of course, Devin Townsend's Ocean Machine and City mm. do well, for see, me. I was really, I, I was really um, not reminded of City at all, but more of uh, our very first record club that being addicted by this record. Yeah, that's that. I mean, Devin just shares the ethos of this band in the sense that he is a such a maximal artist. It's yeah, almost it's impossible. Also the combination for me. with like prog metal and pop that both the records. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Con considering that this came in '96, it's almost impossible for me to believe that Devin wasn't influenced by it in some way. He didn't say it in his autobiography, but I feel like if I, if like you know, he, he was to say his musical influences now, I feel like that has to be one of them. Or, or maybe it's just a remarkable coincidence of kindred spirits on two sides of the Atlantic. I have no idea. Mm. Um, yeah, if if you haven't listened to this record, get ready for someone to be a, like aggressively British. Um, <laughs> is very British. That's that's this this podcast yeah. in a nutshell. <laughs> Even though only British. one of us is a Brit, oh, only yeah, one of us is yeah. a Brit, and yet this is aggressively British. Well, yeah, yeah, that's the thing. Get ready for someone to be aggressively British. <laughs> Not going to say any names. I want to be going to name names. Yeah, but, it's um, me. But yeah, uh, fucking Jesus. All right, All right. I, this has been an exorcism for me. Let's do oh, our good. favorite tracks and ratings. Favorite tracks and yeah. ratings. Jake. Uh, st okay, starting off. All right. Uh, my favorite tracks are Nurses, Whispering Verses, Fiery Gun Hand, and Dog Like Sparky. Least favorite track, I'd probably say um, uh, Bell Clinks. Just it's just what it, it, it like it's not even that it's specifically like annoying or grating it's just the song that's just like it, it leaves the least impression of a, an album of songs that leave the most impression that has ever been impressioned so i guess that um and i'd give it a six uh myself i would say my three favorites are uh probably Dirty Boy, uh, Dog Like Sparky, and Fiery Gun Hand. My least favorite would be, hmm. Yeah, it's it's tough to choose, but I I guess I'll. Uh, oh yeah, quite tough. I don't know. I'll just say. Uh, pass on least favorite because there's it's hard for me to identify one singular track i dislike or, or like like noticeably less than others but there are tracks there are a number but not like one specific one uh anyways rating for me would be a six out of ten it's uh interesting for sure and i'm glad we uh covered it me too. Hey. I have to say this went better than I expected. Yeah, <laughs> same. I'm glad that I wasn't just flailing like a fucking moron. No, but like, Jake, you brought out the best in me. You all did. You brought out something that I didn't think I was going to be able to do justice. So, fuck. No, you, you, guys... you put that very, very well. Yeah. yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Right. Well, my, my favorite tracks are uh, Bally, Dirty Bell Boy, Be Belly eye, sorry, it's belly eye. I'm gonna keep saying belly because I wanna. Um, and also nurses whispering verses. Um, and my least favorite track is um, probably uh, I'm gonna say billion. No, not billion. Yeah, billion. Go and sod it. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna give this target a seven and a half out of ten. Cool. 
Well, I because fa- favorite three favorite tracks is stupid for a record that's twenty two songs long and in my right. top five of all time. Yeah, for real. I'm just gonna list a few, and I'm just gonna because I forgot. I'm just gonna very very briefly just touch on a couple of things I love about them, because um, a lot of my favorite songs I weirdly haven't even talked about. Um, I'll start off. Uh, Dirty Boy, I've talked plenty about. That's my favorite song on the record. Um, but I also want to shout out um, Belly Eye, which is um, Search is obviously also shouted out, but I think is delightfully manic um it's a song about like wanting to murder children but also trying to maintain (laughs) a calm exterior and just having a complete internal meltdown and it's also got that themes of media saturation in it as well it's among us um i also want to in fact this is there's like a fucking three track run here that's like three of my favorite songs in the record belly eye horse's tail which i think is amazing uh, it has this uh, amazing section where the riff just builds and builds and builds, and then it goes and it's um, I just fucking lose my mind, and then it just kind of breaks down and suddenly becomes a completely different song in the last thirty seconds. It's a fucking wild um, horse's tail, amazing. I think the first time I listened to this album, I had to stop it, go on Spotify so I could screen record because I can't screen record on Apple Music and screen record the last minute of the song so I could tweet about it because it was that impressive. Uh, Man Who I also want to shout out, which is kind of like, um, was a track that is very influential to Blur and it's actually the poppiest moment on this record. It was released as a single, if you can believe that or not. Mm-hmm. Really great song. Uh, and also, uh, oh, I want to shout out as well um, the final track on this record, Foundling, which I love. It's kind of really psychedelic. It has these wow, wow synths in it. Yeah, yeah, that it, was a good moment. Too. Actually, I, remind I me. Um, I, I struggle to imagine that wasn't influential on the Flaming Lips actually, because they've used that kind of sound of this song quite a lot. Yeah, um, yeah. But that's a great closer, I think. Um, uh so i wanted to yeah. shout that out as well uh not one of my favorite tracks but i also want to shout out the wee interlude that is quiet as a mouse just because i want to give a little bit of information about it is this weird little one and a half minute track that's just spoken word and what it is is um it is tim smith's mother i believe delivering a spoken word monologue to some other person who's probably someone else in the band about how much they want to beat the band's drummer to death um yeah it's just this <laughs> really, it's funny it's just this really absurd moment that comes in, in the in the midst of like more upbeat and bright short songs on the back half of the record that i don't think doesn't get enough due also want to shout out flap off you beak which i think is one of the best hooks of the record um just super super good and and dog like sparky and fiery gun hand which i've talked enough about um and it's a fucking 10 out of 10. <laughs> All right. 10 out of right. 10. So, what are we covering maybe, next week, though? Well, this week's note. record club. 7.4 on average. Ooh. And there are three records yep. like this Carl Crafts, Full Circle Nightmare, uh, One of Tricks Point Never's Magic One of Tricks Point Never, and The Avalanches, We Will Always Love You. Oh, fair enough. Um, Records I feel similarly about. Uh, yeah. So, next week's record <laughs> club is on another podcast well not another person core uh record to a person on this podcast uh and probably an album that i imagine she is zero overlap with fans of this one we're talking about today uh, which is brock hapton's iridescence actually no they're both kind of chaotic records um, no oh iridescence is chaotic as fuck and i love them both so i guess there's the overlap um, but yeah, we're going to be talking about um, uh, Brock Hampton's Iridescence, which is another record that has a really interesting kind of creation story and mm-hmm. things that it explores, and it's going to be emotional as fuck. And don't I don't even record. know how I'm going to begin to, to go about this one, boyos. For the look, look, when we when we get to fucking San Marco, so we be no, we're not going to talk about that. Nope, 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 nope. Let's yeah, for the record just... by creation story, you're not referring to a to a god to a deity deified dog you're referring that, that to unless unless the we deified, wanna be dog unless, like the, unless your god is kevin abstract in which um, case for me that okay. is that is the yeah. case fair enough okay well that only leaves us left to say goodbye to you all until next week rock over london rock on chicago
Blue Buffalo, love them like family, feed them like family.